I challenge you to a duel. Hello and welcome to the Movie Jewel podcast. My name is Peter and I am your host. On each episode of the Movie Jewel podcast we pick a subject based around films then myself and one of my co-hosts each pick a movie that we think best fits that subject. The only rule being you can't pick a film that has already been discussed on the podcast. However you find us in the midst of our first ever Mega Jewel. So this is the concept whereby we pick a chosen subject and we each pick a film for that subject and then across a series of five episodes we each state our case for why we've chosen it. So our first ever subject was the best Steven Spielberg movie. You will have already heard my choice of Jaws, uh, previously discussed on the podcast, uh, Jamie's choice of Raiders of the Lost Ark and Nicole's choice of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And here to join me for this episode uh, is Vanessa Cordner to discuss her choice of Jurassic Park. But before we get into that, just a few reminders about how you can get in touch with us here at the Movie Jewel podcast. You can do so through Facebook, through Instagram. Just search for the Movie Jewel podcast. You can find us at Movie Jewel Pod on X and on Threads. Uh, and you can email us at moviejewelpodcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to check out our Patreon page uh, at patreon.com forward slash the movie jewel podcast in which you can find extra content once a month for just one pound one dollar. And then finally a word of warning there will be strong language in this episode and there will also be spoilers for the chosen film as well. And that's it. Very much hope you enjoy. Gotcha. shouldn't use my name. Dodson! Dodson! We've got Dodson here! See, nobody cares. Nice hat. You're trying to look like a secret agent. Okay, so joining me on this episode of our Mega Jewel season is Vanessa. Vanessa, how are you? I'm good, Peter. How are you? I'm not too bad, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm very well. Very well indeed. Living the dream, as they Living say. Living the dream. Living well, we're just about to talk about something very good, so that will that will that will certainly keep us entertained. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So obviously, you're here to discuss your choice uh, for best Steven Spielberg film. So before we get into your choice and what you've chosen, um, what what's your relationship like with Spielberg? I've been asking everybody this so far. Are you generally a fan of Spielberg? Yeah, yeah, especially early Spielberg. I mean, I am 39, so, I mean, a lot of these movies, especially early stuff, was stuff, like, that I grew up with. Um, I think I've mentioned before that my brother is a total... um, I don't know what the word is, like cinema file or whatever. Like um, yeah. cinephile, is that right? <laughs> so when we were younger, he used to go on and on about Jaws being basically like the perfect film. Like he always says he hasn't got a favorite film, but he talks about Jaws being a perfect film. I that remember sounds like what... a very sensible manual. <laughs> oh, you feel one well actually. Um, like when I was young, I remember watching like ET. Raiders, uh, the, the whole Indiana Jones tri- the original trilogy actually. Um. You know, a lot of these movies just were like movies that I remember watching at like fa- not family events, but like mm. I don't know, like Christmas time and like yeah. bank holiday weekends and They're stuff. Very... Like I didn't see a lot in the cinema when they I saw the one I'm going to talk about. I saw in the cinema, but mm-hmm. most of them came out. I was too young, yeah, or they came out before I was born. But like you, you obviously when we were younger, you only had like your four or five channels yeah. and you know, at Christmas or whatever, they would maybe show the, the, the Indiana Jones films and, yeah. or, you know, E.T. or whatever. And I mean, they still do, I think, but obviously you've got a lot more choice now, but yeah. back then you didn't have a lot of choice. So you would tend to watch these movies. So I associate Spielberg and John Williams, because I think they're kind of like, they come as a pair a little bit. <laughs> uh, 
like just with my childhood basically and I'm a big yeah. fan as I said not as big a fan I, not that I'm not as big a fan I've just not seen a lot of these later stuff to be honest mm. um I love Minority mm-hmm. Report which I saw in the cinema um but I'm not sure oh and I loved actually to be fair um the West Side Story that you did Right, right, okay. His version of that I really quite liked. But a lot of other, like, I've not seen The Fablemans and I've not seen a few of the other big movies that he's done more recently. Mm. Um, but yeah, a fan overall. I think most film fans like Spielberg, to be fair. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so uh, let's get into your choice without further ado then. So, Vanessa, what have you picked as your choice for the best Steven Spielberg movie? I have picked 1993's Jurassic Park. Since the beginning of time, man has searched the earth for evidence of its past. But while some have looked for clues to the mystery, one man has found the way to bring the mystery back to life. I own an island off the coast of Costa Rica. And I spent the last five years setting up a kind of biological preserve. Here, on this private island, science has defied evolution. Where do you get a hundred million year old dinosaur blood? Genetics has mastered creation. We've made living biological attractions so astounding that they'll capture the imagination of the entire planet. And extinction (laughs) is a thing of the past. Welcome to Jurassic Park. What have they got in there, King Kong? None of these attractions are ready yet, of course, but the park will open with the basic tour you're about to take. Hey, look at this. You see something? Dinosaurs and man, two species separated by 65 million years of evolution, have just been suddenly thrown back into the mix together. Can I touch it? How can we possibly have the slightest idea? Do you feel that? What to expect? Fences are failing all over the park. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's nice. The phones are out too. Gotta go. Universal Pictures presents. Hey, hey, hey. I can't get Jurassic Park back online. An adventure 65 million years in the making. Oh, no. It was just a delay. That's all it is. All major theme parks had delays. When they opened Disneyland in 1956, Um. nothing worked. But, John, if the Pirates of the Caribbean breaks down, the pirates don't eat the tourists. You sure we're safe? Yes. Unless they figure out how to open doors. Jurassic Park. So obviously directed by Steven Spielberg because that's who we're talking about and um, starring Sam Neill as Dr Grant, Laura Dern as Ellie, Jeff Goldblum as Malcolm, Richard Attenborough as Hammond and Bob Peck is probably the only other one I'd mention because he's the only one I know kind of offhand as Muldoon. Um, <laughs> based on the novel by Michael Crichton which I'm ashamed to say that I have not read um Mm -hmm. and no i know which we'll talk about because i really should have because i'm a big reader and i love this movie a synopsis i suppose is just um using dinosaur dna frozen and mosquitoes trapped in amber millions of years (laughs) ago um scientists managed to kind of create or clone i don't know if it's clone or create um dinosaurs and present well present day in 1993 and uh, John Hammond creates a theme park basically that um where people can go and see the dinosaurs as they would in a zoo or a safari park for some bizarre reason he decides to stress test this very dangerous theme park with his grandchildren (laughs) and things go out of hand um and he 
realises that maybe this isn't the best idea. So <laughs> I, I just made up that synopsis on the spot, so hopefully it works. That was very good. That's rather <laughs> accurate, yeah, for this film. Absolutely. So well, let's start at the top there. So what is your history with this film? When do you remember first seeing this film? I saw it at the cinema um, on kind of release. So I'm sure I've told this story before, but I was on holiday in Derbyshire with my mum and dad and my two brothers. I would have been eight. I would have been nine in the September. So I would have been eight in the summer. And this was obviously a summer blockbuster. We were still back in the days of the kind of big summer blockbuster. Uh, so it would have been probably the school holidays in Scotland started in June. So it would have been like the end of June, start of July. And um, I remember going to this big multiplex. I don't know what it was. It was probably like a UCI or something at the time. It was packed. Like it was proper. You know, that was back in the day where cinemas were packed when you went to see like new films, um, which I don't think, I mean, you still get busy cinemas, but I don't think we see it quite the same um, today. And um, busy on opening night. They're busy on opening night, but this wouldn't have been opening night, I don't think. I didn't check the exact release date, but I doubt this would have been opening night. And um, I remember, I, I think it was during the day, actually, because my youngest brother would have only been five. And I remember him sitting in mum's knee <laughs> at the bit with the Tyrannosaurus Rex because he was so scared. Um, and I just remember, it, it was one of my, I mean, I've definitely, I was definitely been to the cinema before I was eight. But it's mm. one of my biggest memories of being at the cinema. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I remember, like, people just being in awe. I remember seeing the dinosaurs for the first time. I remember that scene with the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And I just remember being like, oh, my God, this is incredible. And um, I think quite a few other memories I had before that where we had like a kind of local smaller cinema mm. so this was one of the biggest uh, the first memories I've got sorry of like a really big kind of multiplex with like the pick and mix that probably cost an absolute arm and a leg and just being totally immersed mm. in this like magical film which yeah. is possibly the reason that I continue to like it. And also, I suppose, when you're a kid, and even to this day, I'm quite fascinated by dinosaurs. See if there's, like, a new mm-hmm. documentary on the TV about dinosaurs, I tend to watch it. Yeah. Because they're so different to anything we've got now. They live for such a long time. Like, they were on the earth mm-hmm. for millions, of, like, a lot longer than us plebs yeah. will be on the earth because mm-hmm. we are, well, I, think... I mean, not setting fire to it already. But they're so... Do you know what I mean? They're interesting. Mm-hmm. I think, well, I think every child sort of grows up with that sort of fascination of dinosaurs and and that that sort of fascination with the history of these magical creatures really is what they are you know obviously they're they're not fictional creatures they are real creatures that yep. walk to the earth way way before us so it's just intrinsically fascinating to to anybody i think you know i don't think there's anybody who's not fascinated by the concept of a dinosaur and the fact that these creatures were just here long before us. It's just immensely fascinating. You know, my my experience with Jurassic Park is very, very similar to yours. This is the first. This is the film. I mean, it, I don't think it was the first film I went to see at the cinema, but it's the first film that I have recollection of seeing at the cinema. Yeah, yeah. For certain, you know, and I couldn't put hand on heart say it was the first one, but I just have so many vivid memories of watching. You know, I'd, I had friends who went to see it before I did, so they sort of told me little bits and bobs. I remember the um, sort of condensed version being in the school library, like the book that's about 20 pages or something with pictures from the film, and just being absolutely mesmerized by it even before yeah. i'd seen the film and then i went with my mom and her partner at the time uh to the ritz cinema in lincoln it was the only cinema in town um one screen as well <laughs> this was before we got a university so it was mm. it wasn't high on the priority list for lincoln um but i've just a, not just not even just a vivid memory of watching the film i remember the adverts because they were all sort of localized before um before the film so they would be like local businesses and stuff and i just explicitly remember there was a family a father and a couple of kids in front of us and there was an advert for the shakespeare street garage and it played through and as the sound went down the little girl said to her dad are they any good dad and he said they like to think they are (laughs) and i just vividly remember that don't know why 
it's just vividly there in my head as, as a memory of watching Jurassic Park. I loved, I loved that when you used to go to the cinema and you saw local adverts. Like um, like now, the only adverts that you see are the same kind of adverts you get on the TV mm. and stuff. But but back back then, I do remember going to the cinema and seeing adverts for local takeaways and restaurants and like garages and stuff like you said. That's, I hadn't thought about that for a while because you just don't get that anymore. No, absolutely not. It's just fascinating, isn't it? I mean, we do. There's one my local cinema in the woods down at Woodall Spa, which is a very it's it's a very early cinema, and it was there since sort of turn of the century, I think. It's it's a very old old property, um, but they they have a, a couple of sort of still um, adverts and stuff for some local businesses and that, and it's right. very it smells like a museum. Oh. It's great. Uh, <laughs> That but anyway, brilliant. we're getting way off the beaten track here already. Yeah. So yeah, so that's that was my experience watching it at the cinema. And I do remember watching it at the cinema and just being blown away by it, um, which I'm sure uh, we'll get into. Um, so as we've done with these um, these mega jewel episodes so far, we're gonna we're gonna sort of break it down into a, in a few different sections. Um, and I think think first. Uh, we'll we'll run through the cast. So top of the bill really is uh, is Mr. Sam Neill as as Doctor Alan Grant. How do you think he fares in this film? I think he's great, but he's not a typical like hero. Like he's not a Harrison Ford mm. or whatever. Um, like when you first meet him, you know the way he talks to that like wee boy um, and stuff like. He's not grumpy, but like he's obviously very, very interested in his work. But I think he goes on quite an interesting journey throughout the film mm-hmm. because obviously right at the start, he's like, don't like kids, blah, blah, blah. And then obviously by the end, he kind of saves the kids and looks after the kids and stuff. But I think he's, a, I think that we'll get on to it because we talk about the rest, but they're the, the kind of main trio are a, a kind of odd bunch, actually, I think. Yeah. They are, and I mean, I love Sam Neill. I love lots of films that Sam Neill's been in, but I mean, up until this point, he'd been in quite a lot of kind of weird stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, I've always, you know, I've always considered, to a certain point, as Sam Neill being very much a straight man, you know, in in films, and to, you know, from this sort of forward in the films that I'd seen for the next probably five or six years, maybe, Maybe not. Event Horizon was probably the next film I saw with Sam Neill in, but you know, I always saw him as as a very sort of straight straight arrow in in films, and he played very serious characters and things like that. But then you look at what he was in before this, like uh, The Omen Part Three and Possession. Possession, you yeah. and you just think, how did they sort of make that transition or that? Um, that leap of this man is is Alan Grant, who's this very sort of stern, serious paleontologist. You know, it's it's quite a leap at that point to to put him in this kind of role because I don't think he was in anything big, and he wasn't a leading man at that point. Certainly not a Hollywood leading man. No, no, no. I I agree. I mean like things like Possession and Event Horizon and stuff, like he is in kind of strange movies, but he's just, I think at the time it probably would have been considered kind of an odd choice when he, like it could have been somebody like, I mean, Harrison Ford was just some name that I pulled out, but you know, somebody that was a bit more kind of leading man-ish, but I mean, I think he's perfect for mm. the part. Um, I mean, he's the outfit that he wears has like become kind of iconic. People dress up like that now. Like and um, I think he's just fantastic in it. To be, I mean, I think they're all fantastic in it. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, I think he's a really interesting character. Like I said, I think his character changes as the film goes on, which is quite interesting. Yeah, well, he's well. you know he's a he's a reluctant hero, isn't he? And I think that yeah. that sort of is you know we'll we we've got it down as a section on these episodes of of talking about Spielberg hallmarks, but you know the the, the things that we sort of pick up as we as we go along, really, and I think that is a hallmark. It, to a degree, it's like Chief Brody and Jaws. You know, he's he's a reluctant hero, and yeah. and Richard Dreyfuss in in Close Encounters. You know, he's he's not that that film really has a hero, but you know, he's he's not. They're not people who are just sort of action stars, or you know, they're just to be a, a an out and out sort of 
good guy or what you, yeah. do you know what I mean they're not yeah. they're not typical they've, they've they've got flaws or they've got sort of nuances to their to their character you know even when we talked about Indiana Jones you know Indiana Jones isn't he can handle himself he can get into a fist fight and stuff but he's still very flawed whether it's fear of snakes or you yeah. know fucking something up or whatever you know or getting through by the skin of his teeth and that's very much Alan Grant you know he's he's not just getting through because of his his wily sort of um manliness or anything like that you know he's yeah. just getting through as best he can using his brain as best he can I suppose like Indiana Jones one of the reasons I think Indiana Jones is flawed is because he loves his work so much Mm. Which one is it? Is it Raiders where he gets annoyed at the end? Where he gets annoyed at the end because he's wanting he's wanting it to be in a museum. Yeah, it? it comes up quite yeah. a bit in the in, 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 yeah, in, yeah, yeah, it's in maybe the more than one. And it's because he's so like in love with his work. And Alan Grant is also like yeah. that. I mean, you get the impression right from the off that his work is everything to him, mm-hmm. and it's so important to him. Um, so there are similarities between them. But I suppose Sam Neill's just not maybe as Hollywood. As Indiana Jones mm. kind of thing, um, but I think it's like stellar cast. And looking back, like I think at the time, probably some people were probably a bit like that's a bit of an odd choice, but I think it works really well. Mm. But then I think you've also, you know, I mean, the sort of next next in line really to talk about is Laura Dern as as Ellie Sattler, who's probably you know a very similar. You would think very, you know the same sort of things about her casting, really, because you think about the films that she was in beforehand, you know, Blue Velvet and Wild at Heart, two, you know, Lynch's masterpieces, even The Rambling Rose, which I remember watching quite young, and that's, you know, quite a heavy-hitting film. And you wouldn't necessarily think of, you know, Laura Dern as being this sort of plucky... Uh, paleobotanist, I think she is in the, in this yeah. film, isn't she? You know, it's again, you know, it's 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 much more of a straight role for for what she would have done in the past, or certainly what I would have seen that she she'd done before this film. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, when I saw this, I I hadn't seen like any of the David Lynch movies, so I don't know if mm. I really knew her at all. Obviously, since then, I have seen her in other stuff, and again quite weird films again not your typical leading lady mm-hmm. um necessarily and again a bit like alan grant she's obviously completely obsessed with her work i mean mm-hmm. you meet the two of them out in this dig presumably that they've been on for months um a way out in the desert and the two of them that's what they're they're interested in even when they get to the park they don't they're not interested in like the amount of money or anything that they could make it's mm-hmm. all about the science I mean even that bit where she's like fishing about in poo for ages <laughs> like do you know what I mean like That's but at the same time <laughs> but at the same time they're like she's tenacious and she's strong and you know she fights off dinosaurs mm. and like Alan Grant like when you meet him, you probably don't think, oh, this guy's actually going to be able to get by in this park with the kids. And it's the same with her. Like, she she actually is like a really kind of strong female character. Mm. Absolutely. And I think she's got, she's just got, she's just got something about her, Laura Dern as well. She's got such a great screen presence. Yeah. You know, I mean, when you get to Twin Peaks Return. I still have to get she, to that. Which she's in. Um, you'll know what I mean. She and she's kept that going. You know, although she's not had a whole heap of big roles throughout her career, she's had a lot of memorable ones. Whether that's working with Lynch or you know around this sort of time period, and she's got a f- very indelible screen presence, I think. And she's got that something about her that is almost a little bit Gillian Andersony. Do you know? Funnily enough when you were talking there and just after I'd said her about her being like a kind of strong female character, I was thinking of Scully's character and mm. the X-Files, which obviously we talk about a lot. And there is, you, that yeah, I see those similarities actually. Mm. I see the similarities between Laura Dern and Gillian Anderson, but I also see the similarities between her character, Ellie Sandler and Scully, like mm-hmm. Dana Scully. Because yeah. again, she's like really interested in her work and science and yeah. 
but she is tenacious she's strong she's strong-willed mm. and it's quite stubborn as well mm. and I think you see so yeah you definitely and actually if you think about it, I mean this came out like a year before the expert well I think next file started actually mm. sorry about like not that far after this so yeah I, I, I can see similarities there that's actually quite an interesting comparison and you know, going back to to my first, sort of first experiences with this film, this this would probably be the film that sort of opened my eyes to, you know, uh, things like the patriarchy and and you know, a, a women's role in the world kind of thing, and how you know that line that she says about women inherits the earth. Woman inherits the <laughs> earth. You know, and, and that was the the first time I ever remember thinking. Yeah, we always, you know, we always say man, you know, man, man walked the earth or man did this, man did that, great, one small step for man and all that sort of thing. And that's, you know, for a, what I'd have been nine or ten at the time, you know, it's quite an eye-opening turn of phrase, you know. and Absolutely. Because it must have been, again, like we've spoken about before when we've spoken about Scully's character, presumably... That whole kind of, I know she's a paleobotanist rather than a paleontologist, mm -hmm. but I would assume that that kind of field in the early 90s would have been predominantly men. Mm -hmm. She would have Stuffy been working. Man, yeah. yeah, she would have been, you know, it would have been more difficult for her to make a name for herself as a woman, especially as a fairly young woman as well in that field. Um, but the, yeah, the women inherit their. Um, but I, I like think that it's quite, you know, it's, it's maybe a good point to sort of talk about because we've discussed, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Grant, Dr. Sattler at this point. And I think it's quite a fascinating way to take the script that, I mean, it's it, the assumption is that they are a couple. Yeah. And I'm but not it's, not overly, it's not overly no. explicit. And obviously later films, they're not together and, and things like that. But I think it's just a fascinating way to, to, to make a film. You know, there's there's quite sort of this unambiguous relationship between them of whether they're just you know almost maybe with older eyes you maybe think well they're maybe just colleagues that fuck now and then or something like that but you know it's it's quite ambiguous or unambiguous unambiguous uh, ambiguous ambiguous about ambiguous. the relationship you know they're not yeah. they don't you know kiss or they're not overly um... I think at one point there's um Malcolm not say mm. to Grant, are you together? And he says yes, but I got the impression that he's saying that just be a wee bit like I suppose Mulder and Scully. I don't want to keep going back to them, but like because he's yeah. fond of her and he doesn't want this guy who's a bit of a kind of rock star, um, cracking on basically. But no, I don't think like you said. I mean, it might have been that they're colleagues and they've had a bit of a thing now and again, but I don't think that they're a proper couple but i think they've got a lot of respect for one another yeah and they obviously care about one another as well because her reaction when she sees him after not seeing him for a while like they obviously care about one another but i looking but i think when i first saw it i assumed they were a couple but now i'm like no they're not they're not a, they're not a couple couple but i think they're maybe not close. a done not a done deal kind of thing yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. but they are but they are close i think i think they are yeah. very close yeah and those relationships you understand more as you get older like when you're young it's very much like they're either a couple or they're not, and that's it. Whereas as you get older, you realise there's actually different degree. Like you can have mm. relationships where you love people that you're not necessarily romantically involved, or yeah. you know, like or like you said, maybe they slept together once or twice, and you know, yeah. like as you get older, you realise that these kind of relationships aren't as black and white as when you're young, yeah, and yeah. you're either uh, yeah, yeah. So I think that's probably something with older with older eyes. And I've seen this movie so many times now. Like I didn't mention it when we spoke about. <laughs> history but this is very much my comfort movie like if I see it's yeah. on yeah I'll watch it um went to Mexico about a year and a half on holiday was just flicking through the wee tv thing looking for something to watch as the plane was taken off as soon as I saw Jurassic Park was an option <laughs> I didn't watch any of the new stuff like I was just like oh this is an easy you know if I fall asleep or whatever it's fine I know this movie so it's very much a comfort watch for me yeah absolutely so finishing off our sort of trio of, of main stars really in this film uh, Jeff Goldblum as as Doctor Ian Malcolm. I love him. I love him so. Much. I just love. <laughs> I love Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. I just think he's he's a fascinating actor. He has got this kind of sex appeal, but it's not. Mm. It's not of. I mean, 
I say it's not obvious, and then you see these memes here online with shut open with like the leather trousers and stuff, and it's like, well, it's obvious, but it's it's not obvious. Like it's hard to put your finger on. Like he's not like your Brad Pitt or mm. whatever. Like at this point, like Brad Pitt was like one of the biggest stars yeah. in the world. Um, and he wasn't like that. And obviously since then, I've seen like um, Independence Day is another big comfort favourite movie of mine and Jeff Goldblum's in that. Yeah. Uh, and then I've, as I've got older, I've seen movies like, you know, The Fly and stuff where he flexes his, his muscles a lot more. But I think he's just, he's cool. Like compared to Grant, who does initially appear quite kind of straightly stuck mm, up kind stuffy, of thing. Yeah. You've got Malcolm, who's like a chaos Mm. Theorist or whatever the hell. He's a rock star. He's a rock yeah, star. Like, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And I think, and obviously Ellie, when she meets him, she's attracted to mm-hmm. him. She thinks he's cool. He's sexy. Like he's um, funny. Yeah. Like uh, he's all the things that Grant is in. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, he's a bit of an idiot at times. And actually, there's a big chunk of the film where you don't really see him. Mm. very much like after he gets his leg broken but he, like he's out of it for a while but he's also very much the conscience of the film isn't he you know mm. he's the he's mm. the man who's calling everything out and and saying what needs to be said really you know the the things about life finds a way and this 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 whole you know you you just abusing these these creatures that haven't been in existence for however many million years and you're sticking them on a lunchbox <laughs> <laughs> well, like, ex- exactly. I mean, it, that whole speech he does about, you know, just because you could, you never stop to think, no, just because you could, you never stop to think if, if that you, you should. should. Yeah. And it's it's so true because I think the other two are so blown away. Mm. I mean, that's one of the best scenes in the movie when they first see the, you know, the what do you call them? Um, is it Brachiosaurus? Brachiosaurus. When, he, when they first see them, I mean, that's a classic scene. You've got the music and they are so blown away by it because presumably they've been obsessed with dinosaurs since they were kids. Mm-hmm. They work in that field. He doesn't have that connection. So he takes a step back and says, I don't think this is a good idea. And even later on, Laura Dern's character, Ellie, says, I think to um, Hammond, Hammond, um, like like we were kind of blown away mm. by this as well. Like we shouldn't have been. We should have. So he is very much like the the practical, responsible, as you say, the kind of conscious. And he gets some of the best lines because of that uh, in yeah. the movie. But he's just, yeah, he's he's probably well, out I, the three of them. He's my favorite. I think. I always remember being fascinated by the the scene in the helicopter where they're. Um, flying to the island and he mm-hmm. um on the subtitles for this film it's it's attributed as inco- incoherent laughter where he says <laughs> i can't even do it now <laughs> something like that yeah and i always used to be fascinated that by that one as a kid even when i got it, this film on on vhs and i was quite astounded to see at some point in the last six or seven years there is a 10 hour court on youtube of <laughs> just ian malcolm going <laughs> you'll have to get used to dr malcolm <laughs> <laughs> so i'm not the only person who's fascinated by that but yeah he's i mean he's just he's very typical jeff goldblum obviously but it just fits so well into this this sort of character, and I think it's probably having. I, I'm not going to sit here and claim that I've read the novel, but I've listened to the audiobook of the novel, oh, and it well, probably it probably is the the closest. I mean, you know, Al, uh, Alan Grant and Ali Sattler are probably not too far off, but it's probably the closest interpretation of of what's in the book. Mm-hmm. You know, it's obviously what happens to his character is a fair bit different, if I remember rightly. But I think I've I've heard that. I mean, I really, really well, need to be, read it. But... That's that's a lot, and it is a good book. You know, just to maybe segue a little bit into into the novel, it's it's a very a very good book, very different. You know, there's lots of plot points in it that are, that pop up in the Lost World, which we'll oh, maybe right. talk about. Yeah, later on, the opening of the Lost World is the opening of the book, if I remember rightly, uh, with the little girl on the beach. 
But yeah, he's he's definitely he's almost sort of the life and soul of the party, I suppose. He's you know he's 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 the more energetic of the cast, and Yes. he's got you know some of the the more comedic beats of the film. Yeah. Again, going back to my memory of watching this in the cinema, that was the point where they cut for the intermission when we used to have inter intermissions in old cinemas and stuff. Was that's one big pile of shit. Was was the point where they broke up for the for the intermission? But yeah, he's he's he, well, he's just he's just great, and he Jeff Goldblum, Yeah, he's just I fantastic. love Jeff Goldblum, and see if you see him now, he looks fantastic. Uh, he's so tall as well; he must be about six He does, foot four you know. or something. I mean, even even as a heterosexual man, there is something about Jeff Goldblum that is just Yeah. it's just fascinating, and he's got such a charm. Even re, you know, in real life as well, when you see him being interviewed and stuff, he's very. You know, he feels very real, and he feels very um, appreciative of of the life that he's had, and and the fans that he has, and all that sort of stuff. He's, you know, he's a he's a very, he seems like a very nice man, and loves his jazz, uh, <laughs> as we know. Um, like Mr. David Duchovny enjoys to do a bit of a uh, bit of music here and there, even Yeah, if he's fine. they're even if they're not fantastic at it. <laughs> The privileges of being a Hollywood superstar. yeah You can exactly you can try anything and folk will still exactly buy it. well apparently um just again just a sideline third one of the episode um keith sutherland's playing uh was was playing lincoln i think a couple of weeks ago with his band Wow. yeah i'm not that big of a keith sutherland fan though so i don't give a shit <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's okay. So moving on to Richard Attenborough, I suppose probably the next big star really to talk about in this film, um, as 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 John Hammond, and you know he's he's not somebody that I had a lot of experience with. I don't think I'd seen Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street, which would have been probably the best sort of introduction to him as an actor at Yeah. this point and and my age at the time. And I can't say I've seen him in a lot since. You know, maybe some of the old classics, you know, The Great Escape and things like that. But he's always John Hammond to me, uh, Richard Attenborough, and I was, you know, again always fascinated by by this portrayal in this film because he's he's so and it, he, you know, maybe say you know it's quite wrong actually to say that maybe Jeff Goldblum is the most energetic energetic in this film because he's sidelined for half of it, but Richard Attenborough just brings this sort of childlike. energy to to john hammond i suppose and he's just very much you know about spectacle and he's just like a kid with a toy Yeah. when it comes to his creation and creating this park and bringing these dinosaurs back to life he's not a scientist he is a showman he Yeah. is pt barnum he is a, you know a, a, a circus leader which we he sort of talks about in the film, you know, being, uh, you know, creating this flea circus and things like Yeah. that. And he wanted to create something that is real. And he's done it in this. And he's he's always been just a fascinating character to me because he, in the novel, he's very much the villain of the piece. And he's treated, Mm -hmm. I know that, even though I've not read the novel. he's, he's treated very much like that. But here he is quite a sympathetic character to a point. You get that he is supposed to be a bit sort of mad with the 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 creation that he's that he's he's brought to life. You know, he's he he doesn't think about consequences and things like that. He's very sort of balls to the wall, and he's just let's do this. This is going to be great, and it will go down in that the annals of history. Yeah. But he also has this very sort of. Um, This sort of naivety to, to to the whole thing, which is ultimately obviously the, the downfall. It is. I mean, like you, like when I watched it as a kid, I thought he was just like this awesome guy that wanted to create this amazing thing. I mean, even at one point when the lawyer's talking about like, oh, we can charge £10,000 a ticket. And he's like, no, I want this to be something that everybody can Yeah. see. But as I've got older, and I know about, even though I've not read the book, I know about the portrayal in uh, the book. But as I've got older, I am like, this guy's a nutcase. Like bringing his kids, his grandkids, Yeah. to the park before it's even open 
for this trial run is insane, like before they even know it's safe. Um, and when he gets really angry about, you know, things not working and whatever, it's not just about the safety of his grandkids. It's about the fact that this great plan that he's got isn't going to come to fruition. Mm. And um, But I think there's more, there's definitely, you know, compared to the novel, there's more of an arc in the film than there is a right. novel because it, right. you know, there is that point where he knows fully that his his grandchildren are in danger, specifically, you know, the, with the rupture attack in the command centre or whatever we call it. Yeah. And he gets very passionate and very angry and, you know, he's shouting. And, you know, I think there is that arc and that, that leads to the realisation that it doesn't fucking matter about park or anything like that and you know the, the line that we get towards the end which i know we're skipping to the end here but you know uh, dr grant says you know after careful consideration i've decided not to endorse your park and he says so have i yeah 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 no i mean the character is interesting in in the movie i think it's just thinking about it with older eyes you think what the fuck was he thinking um like they should have tested this park with like trained professionals, not yeah. with child, not with children. Mm-hmm. But I have heard the portrayal in in the book is quite different. Like you, I mean, I can't, I don't know when that version of Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street came out. I hadn't seen it. The same year, I think, if Was I remember it? rightly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I hadn't seen it when I saw Jurassic Park before I saw Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street, and um, he is very much like like a Santa Claus type character, mm. even in this. I mean, his accent is bizarre, though. Like, this yes. weird accent. He's sort of Scottish in the first yeah. third of the film, and then he's not for the rest of it. <laughs> and it's a, it's a weird Scottish accent that kind of comes and goes a little mm. bit, which is, as a Scottish person, you do notice quite a bit. Well, like, it's, the gar- it's the... Um, it's the... Hey, we were saving that for today. I got it. Yes, you know, yes. It's, it's, I... That's so Scottish. And then it just sort of fizzles out through the rest of the Aye. film. It's it's a slightly Aye. odd choice. I don't know why they didn't just leave him with his own accent, to be honest. Um, yeah. Because he's not Scottish, is he? He was English. No, he's English. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's not, I don't think it, the, the character is not Scottish in the book either. Or it just seems a bit of an odd. It was an odd, it was an odd choice. Yeah. But I suppose it's, it's kind of quirky and it's... It's what it, I don't dislike the movie because I mean it's bizarre, mm. but it's it is quirky and quite lovable. So mm-hmm. even though it, it is a bit crazy, it kind of still works, and people yeah. talk about it. But people talk about it in quite a loving way. People don't mm. you know criticize it too much. But but no, he is an interesting character certainly, um, and I think he's well cast um, to do it yeah. that way because obviously if they'd wanted to do it more like the book, he would have been mm. more a villainous character, and they obviously yeah, decided yeah. not to go down that route. Yeah, he's much less sympathetic in the book. But well, let's move on to maybe another hallmark of the um, of of Spielberg's work. Really, certainly a lot of the films that we're discussing on this little mini series um, is the children, the child actors in this film. Um, so Joseph Mazzello, who plays Tim, and Ariana Richards, who play Lex, uh, who plays Lex. Uh, what did you think of their performances in this film? I think they're both really good. Mm. Um, they didn't annoy me the way that child actors often do. Yeah. I think they're believable. I think um, you buy into both of their characters. Um, despite being brother and sister, they're very different. Which is, you know, like a lot of brothers and sisters, they're very different. Yeah. Um, Timmy is very, you know, interested in the dinosaurs and whatever. She seems a lot less so. She's just more interested because she's a hacker, mm. apparently, which at the time was this cool new thing. <laughs> and um, she's a vegetarian and is horrified by some of the stuff that she sees. But, like, when you see them in peril, you know, that bit where they're under the Jeep and they're getting mm-hmm. shoved into the mud and stuff, like, they're both brilliant. The bit before that, when they're in the car and you can see how scared that mm. they're getting. And then, you know, the lawyer runs away and yeah. Lex is, you know, he left us, he left us. Like, <laughs> and you can imagine being that age. I mean, being this age, if I was in that yeah. situation, I would want somebody to stay with me. Like if you were faced with something like that. So I think they're both actually really good. And I know, I don't think either of them went on to have huge careers. I could be mistaken, but I don't think. Think. No, not really. I mean, um, Ariana Richards has been in Tremors before this, right. very small part. She's not done Tremors. a great deal after that. 
Um, and the only thing I can think Joseph Mazzello was in was he played uh, John Deacon in Bohemian Rhapsody, the bassist from Queen, which I didn't realise till after I'd watched the film. Okay, well, I did, I've seen that film and I didn't know that. I don't know either. And I, yeah. I, I like I quite like that film yeah. actually. When you watch it again now, she's... it's Tim from Jurassic <laughs> Park playing the bassist. <laughs> she's she is an artist or something. I'm I listen yeah. to I've, yeah, I've yeah. listened to more, more than one podcast about uh, Jurassic Park over the years, and I'm sure I heard that she was in that's what she did. She wasn't acting yeah. at all now. But, but no, I think I think they're both really, really well yeah. cast well, and they do the job well. You know, we talked about it's you know, especially with um uh nicole about close encounters of the third kind and it's we sort of dipped in really there of, about spielberg's knack for really getting some great child performances um you know you can't it, it's it's rare that you get a a bit of a dodgy child performance in a spielberg film i think he knows how to get the best out of a child actor yeah. You know, especially when you think about things like E.T., even oh, yeah. Hook to a degree. Um, this, you know, the kids are a little bit annoying in that. But, um, you know, he's got a big cast of kids to to deal with in that film. But, you know, most, I know all, all of his films that have got a kid performance in, you know, Temple of Doom, with K.Q. Kwan as a as short round. Yeah. He's just a master of of getting the best out of kid kid actors, basically. Yeah, and I think as well because because a lot of us saw these movies as kids, you identify yeah. Yeah. with the kids at the time, and even when you get older, you still identify with them because mm-hmm. of the age you were when you first saw it. Um, but even as you get older, like a lot of these kids don't annoy me as they do um, mm-hmm. in other movies. So no, I think I think that the, the, they both did a really good mm-hmm. job, and it must have been tricky because of the like the special effects and stuff, what they were acting against yeah. must have been quite new at the time. So I think, yeah, I think they both did Absolutely. really well. Absolutely. Right. So let's sort of round up the cast here. Let's just quickly sort of touch on um, some of the other performances in this film, because there's two or three more yeah. uh, that we need to sort of touch on. So Bob Peck as, as Robert Muldoon, who's the sort of uh, gamekeeper uh, for the island. I think, you know, from my point of view, he's such... A sort of calm and sort of well mannered performance, but it's so believable. You know, when he talks about how dangerous these animals are, specifically the velociraptors, mm. and that whole sort of relationship that he has with those animals, those particular sort of species of dinosaur, you're so invested in it. And, you know, that, that arc of his or in the film. Is probably one of the more believable, and you 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 realize before you even meet the the raptors and the velociraptors, you believe how dangerous they are just from his performance, and you are there for the danger that they pose. You know, you get a little bit from Alan Grant at the start about how you know vicious these creatures are, but Muldoon sort of puts that across so much more matter of fact and that he you know he's dealt with game big game you know whether it's lions or or whatever and he's never met he's never come across anything like this but it's just such a professional well-acted performance as his character that that really sells it he's great i mean he's a bit like malcolm because he's the only one really at the start that's acknowledging the danger. How dangerous, yeah. yeah, how dangerous they are. And um he obviously really knows his stuff, but he respects the animal. Well, hey, they are animal. Are they animals? I don't know. Um I suppose they are he, he respects them as well as um being fascinated by mm. them and he and he fears them, which is normal because yeah. you should fear these animals. He's got incredible legs in this film, right? He wears yes, shorts the whole time. His legs are so much. He looks like a champion cyclist or something. His legs are <laughs> unbelievable. But no, I Those think khaki shorts. Nah, he's he is not in the movie that much, but he's very effective. He gets mm-hmm. some amazing lines, and actually, the way that he goes in the movie is very kind of apt as well, mm-hmm. because like. I'm sure that if you'd asked them 
how how you would want to go. That's probably what he would say. Mm-hmm. Um, and even right at the end, he's like respecting the Velociraptors because they're so mm-hmm. clever and they communicate with one another. Okay. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I think. I mean, I haven't seen him on much else. I know he was in. Oh, there was a TV show that he was in that my parents rewatched recently on iPlayer, and I can't for the life of me think of the name of it. Because I haven't seen him in many things, but this TV programme that he was in apparently was great. Oh, it's going to annoy me. Um, but I, I think his performance is, is fantastic. Yeah, I know what you mean. I can't think of it. I've not seen it, whatever it was. I can't, but I remember my mum saying, oh, you really need to watch this. And I, I do think Bob Peck's really, really good in this film. Yes, yes, he is, Absolutely. Um, so Wayne Knight as as Dennis Nedry, who's our real sort of villain of the piece. Um, what are you thought? But is he? Well, my thoughts are, I'm not sure he is a villain. <laughs> okay. I I think, like, we have this terminology at work about a single point of failure, where you have like one person that can do something and if for whatever reason that person isn't so say you've got one person that knows how to do a specific thing yeah and then they the old kind of analogies they get hit by a bus or whatever yeah but just never happens so let's just say something a bit more normal like they're you know they go off sick for whatever mm-hmm. reason and a couple of things i think first of all why aren't you paying this guy a fortune like why aren't why is he having to go somewhere else for more money like just pay the guy because he is like the gatekeeper to the whole park and yet he is a bit of a dick <laughs> but um my kind of thoughts are there shouldn't just like it shouldn't be the case that he can do that and then the whole thing falls apart there should yeah. be a number of people that are capable of overriding whatever it is that he's done <laughs> to the system but also john hammond is obviously a multi-millionaire yeah. that's the only reason he could do this in the first place so if this guy is so important to the park, just fucking pay him a million pound or whatever it needs to be so that he's not tempted to go elsewhere for more money. So I'm not sure if I would... Yeah, but then, you know, as, 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 as a manager who sort of, you know, deals with people's payroll and things like that, where do you stop with that? You know, for all we know, he's already been paid an absolute fortune. And you just keep going and going and going. But then also, you know, yes, if he's the one person who can deal with a catastrophic failure in the systems and things like that, you also don't pay him to expect him to shut every fucking thing down (laughs) and try and fuck it off the island with your life's work kind of thing. You know, he's, he's, he's obviously the villain of the piece. If he hadn't have done what he'd done, then chances are everything would have run smoothly for the weekend. I don't I'm not convinced of that. Mm. I think I think having I think whatever you did, something would go wrong. If it hadn't been humanly caused with Dennis Nidri's um character, then uh, with Dennis Nidri, then I think it would have been that the the animals were too strong or the velociraptors would have figured out how to get out or whatever. Like I'm I just think the whole kind of moral of the story is like man shouldn't and I say man meaning man and woman just shouldn't fuck about with this yeah. kind of stuff like the dinosaurs were on the earth they no longer are you yeah. don't try and bring something back I mean I do understand why you're calling them the villain of the piece I just think that even if he hadn't been involved something else would have gone wrong okay. um yeah we will agree to disagree on that one. Okay, so then just a just a couple of little little bit parts in this film. I mean Samuel L. Jackson as as Ray Arnold, who's the sort of know, system engineer, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Um my first introduction to Mr. Samuel L. Jackson. Um would have been me. It's it's strange what he wasn't him in a film. lot of kids. He wasn't in a lot of kids. No, he wasn't. <laughs> funnily enough, no. It's not. It's not. It's quite unusual to see him in a performance where he's not calling someone a motherfucker. Um, and he quite could, quite easily could have called some motherfucker in this film uh, at various points. But yeah, he's just he's just great. I think. Um, no, he's yeah. for an intro, first introduction to Samuel L. Jackson. This is a great place to start, especially when you're young, and sort of get his sort of 
his vibe really because it is very Samuel L. Jackson without being overly Samuel L. Jackson. Um, but yeah, he's a great little performance. Yeah, he's great. And you can see how stressed he's getting and because he's smoking and he's asked you <laughs> at one point, right? And, you know, I am a smoker, but there's nothing I, like, I hate more than an like, overfilling ashtray. Like, I'm always, like, there's, like, two or three... How's, um, how's yours holding up tonight? That's the third one of the night. Isn't it? I know, <laughs> I know. But it's still not overflowing. But see the idea of an ashtray with just, like, hundreds of bits? Mm. Oh, no, no, I just... Oh, that just gives me the willies. So, uh, <laughs> when I see his ashtray, I'm just like, hey, put your ashtray in the bin. <laughs> Um, but uh, no, for being somebody in the movie that's not in it very much, I would say, yeah, he is. And like you, I hadn't seen him in anything, I've obviously seen him in loads of things since. But as you say, like very different parts, a lot swearier. But I mean, you're never going to get mother, it's very, in it's quite memorable. I mean, it's like, I mean, there's there's a, there's a series on YouTube, I haven't watched that even quite recently, but called How It Should Have Ended which is like an animation of like films of like, it, it basically points out plot holes and things like that. Um, and the one for Jurassic Park is quite funny because it's like, so the part it's, it's sort of, there's a section where it's after Ellie Sattler's um, gone down and the, the arm comes down on her and she's like, thinks that it's, um, it's Ray Arnold. And then at some point in this animation, he turned the character of Ray Arnold turns back up and she's like, I thought you were dead. And he's like, Why? She said, Because this arm like fell on me. And he's like, I'm not the only black person. I might not be the only black person on this island. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, I mean, let's just touch on um probably the other villain of the piece, really. Uh Donald Gennaro, played by Martin Ferrero, who's the, the sort of blood sucking lawyer, as he's quoted in this film. Uh, what do you think about him? I think he's good. I think it is a bit stereotypical having yeah. like the blood suck a lot. And we thought that was hilarious as kids because my dad is a retired lawyer. At the time that we watched this, he was a practicing, he was a, a criminal lawyer, whereas I'm assuming this guy is like a corporate lawyer. Mm. But um, so we all thought it was really funny the fact that, you know, the lawyer gets killed first and stuff <laughs> because our dad uh, at the time was a practicing lawyer. Um, I think he plays the part well. I mean, it's a slightly one dimensional part, let's be honest. Yeah. Unlike a lot of the other characters where we've talked about, they have got a bit of an arc, they've got a bit of depth. He doesn't have any depth no. whatsoever. And he is just there, I think, to represent the kind of capitalism, mm. the corporation. I mean, you see how uneasy he is, the bit that he's in where is it is it Costa Rica or something where he's you know floating it going down the and you know that's obviously not his wheelhouse at all and even being in the park he looks really uneasy yeah, like yeah. it's unlike the rest of them that are quite excited and stuff about it all he can see are like dollar signs mm -hmm. um I think his performance is fine but out the lot of them I would say he is definitely the most one-dimensional character mm -hmm. probably yeah. But it's fine because not every character needs to have depth. Like you don't need like I'm not one of these people that thinks every character, you know, you need to find out a bit of background about them and yeah. need to have a journey. Like he does what he needs to do for that mm. part and they get rid of him quite quickly, which I think right from the off, I think you don't think he's gonna last that long. Aside from the opening, he's the first he's the first yeah. character that we see die. You know, he's yeah. you know, I think this being a family film specifically you know you have to not have too much um investment in that first in that first sort of demise of the film i suppose yeah yeah you know he's you know he comments uh around the the dinner table you know we can oh, we can have a coupon day yeah you know and that's very much speaking to probably you know 99 percent of the people sat in the cinema watching this film and you know Hi. that he's talking to you yeah that you know every so often we'll we'll make it cheap enough for reg, you know normal people to normal enjoy people. kind of thing so i think you know he's not set up to be like a sacrificial lamb or anything like that he's just yeah. there to be fodder which is you know it is fine you know and that's very much how it is in the novel as well um, right but yeah, he's but he's he's good at that. I think Martin Ferreira is, you know, he's been in one or two bits that I've seen where he's very he, he very much plays a sort of odious character who, you know, you're not meant to like. And I think he's he's quite good at that. He's yeah. He's uh he's a very capable actor when it comes to that kind of role. 
But yeah, I don't think there's really anybody else within the cast. I mean, B.D. Wong, he has a much bigger role in the later films. Yeah, he, he does come into it later on uh, in a much bigger way. Although, again, I mean, I think he does what he needs to do yeah. in, in this movie. Um, I mean, he's just like the science guy, basically. Yeah, yeah he's but, the exposition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so mo moving on from the cast, let's get down to the nitty-gritty of this film and talk about the special effects and the dinosaurs. I mean, obviously, we start off quite um, almost... Uh, it's almost like Jaws, this film. I think he took a lot of inspiration for what worked well in Jaws. Yep. For Jurassic Park, because our opening uh, sort of deals with this, this movement of, of the velociraptors um, on the island, and we don't see... A, a great deal in that first sort of scene. No. But enough to know you shouldn't fuck with these animals. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, enough to know these are dangerous, dangerous animals. I mean, that guy dies at the start, mm -hmm. doesn't he? Yeah. So, yeah. like, but like you said, it's just enough so that when you actually see the dinosaurs in full, you're totally blown yeah. away because of how, um, how, and I mean, the special effects in this movie are still talked about today. Yeah. Um, because of how good they are. And like, don't get me wrong, when I watch it now, some of the daytime scenes, I think, mm -hmm. are maybe not as effective. No. But the, the nighttime scenes and the stuff with the animatronics, because of course it's not all CGI. And That's I think it. that works so well. You know, I think you know specifically i mean we'll we'll come back to maybe some of the earliest you know i mean well before we get into it let's say let's maybe talk about the brachiosaurus scene because that's yeah. probably the biggest sort of impactful scene in terms of uh, the cgi first seeing dinosaurs and you know we're we're taken along on that journey as 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 viewers yeah of you know, we see these bits at the start. We don't. We you know, obviously, I think anybody who goes to watch this film knows what the fuck they're gonna they're in for. You know what you're gonna see, but it doesn't take away from that scene of seeing it for the first time when you know Doctor Grant, Doctor Sattler is seeing it for the first time as well. You are still sat there in awe and wonder at what is there on screen. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and it's an incredible scene because you're seeing their reaction. Mm -hmm. You're having the same reaction. I know we're going to come on to talk about the music, but the, you've got the music kind of swelling at the same time. And, um, yeah, that, that first scene where you see them properly and then it's, it pans out. So, obviously, at first you're just seeing the, the, the dinosaurs, you know, eating off the trees, but then it spans out. And you kind of see a bit, mm. a bit bigger of the park and you see all the other ones, that, you know, the the water and stuff. Um, like, even still watching that scene, like, yeah, kind of goosebumps watching it. Like, it's fantastic. And that is partly because of the music. But, I mean, mm. that's, again, like, you're talking about Jaws. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's everything with Spielberg, isn't it? You know, it's the performances, it's the music, it's the visuals that you're seeing. You know, you believe it, you know, in it's, it's certainly in Sam Neill's performances and and and... Uh, Laura Dern's performance you feel it you feel that these people are just in awe of what they are seeing and they are just fascinated by it and they are just taken aback by it really that you know they're almost sort of speechless yeah so the performance and the script and everything just works in such great synchronicity yeah. to make this scene a thing of wonder yeah and it is, you know, they're acting to nothing. There's nothing there that's eating off the tree or anything like that. They're acting to nothing, and it's just, just an absolute wonder that they can pull it off. Yeah, it's an, it's fantastic. It's one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie. In fact, it's probably one of my favorite scenes in any movie hmm. ever. Um, it is fantastic, and it does stand up, even though I said some of the CGI. In the daytime, there's actually a specific scene I'm talking about later on. But even taking that into account, this scene is just, it's like magic. It's like magical, which I think Spielberg mm. does. He makes these scenes that are like magical. I mean, I would, I, you know, this isn't my choice, but I would, dis you know, I disagree with you. I think, although they're maybe not as crisp in the daylight, 
it still holds up so well. I mean, let's get to the you know the big piece of this film. The probably the most memorable section of this film is the the you know the T Rex attack or oh, the, the initial T Rex attack, which is just an absolute marvel of cinema. And it's amazing. I there's genu genuinely points in this scene that I can't tell what is animatronic and what is CGI, and that is just the biggest compliment that I can pay to the making of this film. And I still can't. There's still points where I'm like, mm, I don't think that is. That could be. But you know, even to this day, I don't know what CGI and what isn't in that scene. No, that's fair. It's an incredible... I mean, it's the scene that I remember most mm -hmm. from the cinema, partly because I remember my brother sitting in my mum's knee because he was so scared. <laughs> But like sitting in the cinema and seeing that in the dark and they're in the dark. And then, you know, the bits where you see the T-Rex's the face on the side of the car, like breathing out and stuff. And um, I think a lot of it is animatronics because a lot of it looks so... But but you're right, parts of it must be CGI, like the bit where the T-Rex the is running and you see the, you know, objects in the rear view mirror mm -hmm. clear closer than they are. That must be CGI. Yeah. But... It's just so well done. And the acting is so good as well. Yeah. That regardless of whether they're acting with, uh, you know, a puppet, basically, or mm. with nothing, like, yeah. you completely believe it. And it's, in my mind, as much as I think that first scene where they see the dinosaurs is magical, this is probably the scene that I remember most yeah. from the movie. And I think technically it's the, the best done scene in the whole movie. And it does make you genuinely feared these animals because up until that point you haven't seen any mm -hmm. of the carnivores you've only seen the kind of omnivores yeah. you've seen the ones at the start you've seen the sick stegosaurus is it that's sick uh triceratops triceratops that's it um and they are you know obviously i'm sure they're dangerous in their own mm -hmm. way but they're, they're not trying to eat you yeah um and then to see this massive thing with these mm -hmm. massive teeth and the noises it makes which mm -hmm. apparently were a mixture of like several different animals there's like yeah. cows there's lions there's all sorts of things that make this like it's not just a roar it's like a roar but also this kind of guttural mm. sound um it's got some meat behind it yeah yeah, yeah. and you do believe this and because that's the thing is i mean like the t well, i think the t-rex is actually a hero of this movie and subsequent yeah. movies yeah but like it like the t-rex doesn't know i mean at one point i'm sure was it Grant or Malcolm says, you know, they don't know what century, or was it one of them mm, says, like, they yeah. don't know what century they're in. And this animal is just like, doesn't know where it is. You know, its instinct is to hunt. Mm. And, you know, it's even like ripping the rubber, um, you know, the, the tires off the car mm. and stuff, which I'm like, oh, don't eat that. That'll probably give you indigestion. <laughs> like, eat one of the people. <laughs> that'll, that'll be I fucking love the T-Rex in, in these movies. Mm. Like, I think, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll get on it when we talk about the Velociraptors, but I do think the T-Rex becomes the kind of hero and it's obviously what you see. I mean, I've got like Jurassic Park t-shirts and stuff and the, the yeah. iconic um, image mm. is like the T-Rex kind of fossil. And um, yeah, I just think that the, the T-Rex is absolutely... But I think this, this is where this is where Spielberg is very clever, you know, and I've sort of touched on his, his it may be taken some elements of, of Jaws and stuff. And, you know, it, it is very much this, you know, as, as the quote is in Jaws, you know, this, this thing lives to eat and sleep and make little babies kind of thing. You know, it's it's a it's a creature of its existence. You know, it just does yeah. what it needs to do. Yeah, and but, we still have animals like that around. I mean, if you yeah. think about things like lions and yeah. tigers and predators like that, like um, sharks, like alligators, crocodiles, and yeah. stuff. Like a lot of these, like carnivorous, kind of top of the food chain type. I mean people to a certain extent like mm. we sometimes pretend that there's a lot more that we're trying to do yeah. but actually you know is there um so it's but not you... doing anything wrong it's just doing no. what it's meant to do but he's also very clever in that you know we don't see you know it holds off you get this this whole sort of arc in the first or sort of what middle part of the story i suppose or second quarter maybe um that they're, they're not seeing anything you know they're going on this safari and they're seeing fuck yeah. all 
and they're getting quite pissed off about it. And then, you know, they 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 finally start to see things when things go wrong, and it's very much a creature of, um, you know, they're not there to be. The same as with zoos, you know, you can go to a zoo and think, oh, fucking hell, the tigers are just sat there doing fuck all, but they're not there to perform. No. And, you know, but we don't see that, you know, we don't, because we don't see it, it just builds that anticipation to, to seeing it. And even before we get the big reveal and you first see the, the T Rex, you know, it's almost that cute again, back to Jaws and not seeing the shark, which was, I know, was not something that they intended it was yeah, something yeah, yeah. that that just happened because the shot won't work but here he almost uses that as a plus point you know you don't see the t-rex you see the vibrations in the water and it's just such a great build to finally see in the t-rex i mean in that scene it's something that's always bugged me even when i first saw it is the fact that the T-Rex just steps out, but then when the car goes over, it's about a 40-foot drop behind the wall, and I've never figured that out. Yeah. I, I always I always hoped that it would explain that in the um, in the novel, but it doesn't. But anyway, we're, we're, you know, that's, that's a minor piece to this. But then, you know, we get these sort of little little bits in between before we sort of build up to the, the finale with the Velociraptors, and... We get the the Dilophosaurus that that sort of attacks uh, Dennis Nedry, which that's is... interesting because even though the Dilophosaurus is small, mm-hmm. that in a sense makes it even scarier because you can imagine it. Like you can't mm-hmm. imagine the size of the T Rex really, but the Dilophosaurus is the size of like a big dog or a p- small pony or something. I don't know it. Like it's not that big. I mean, it can get in the car with them. Mm-hmm. And um, was it done with animatronics? I think mostly that one is right. animatronic, yeah. But I mean, that's probably that is probably the most sort of horror element of this film. I think, yeah, yeah. It's very, yeah. you know, it's very much that. I mean, I mean, I'm just, I've got myself to safety, and then it's great. And I mean. As much as I have different views about Dennis and Nedry from you, I mean, he does get his come up and <laughs> he shouldn't have done what he done. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so it is kind of poetic justice. But I think that that bit is, as you said, I mean, I think the whole film's a horror movie in, the, mm-hmm. in a creature feature sense. I mean, I think Jaws yeah, yeah. is a horror movie too. Um, but that is the most kind of horrific bit. Because like I said, you can imagine <coughs> like being in a car <coughs> with something that size about like, I don't know, could you or something mm-hmm. <coughs> trying to get you? And then obviously it shoots the ink, venom, yeah. Poison, whatever yeah. it is, <coughs> the blinds them. Uh, and then you've got the fact that at the time, <coughs> excuse me, um, the rain's getting heavier and heavier and he's losing his foot in. And, you know, it's a, it does look horrendous, but, um, but no, that bit is, that bit is really, really good. Well, I mean, let's move on to the Velociraptors because you know this is the the, the final sort of third of the film. Really, is is mainly centered around the Velociraptors and their their sort of threat. Um, and I'd almost sort of say quite the opposite of what I did with the T Rex because it is a little bit more clearer, I suppose, with the Velociraptors. The difference between the CGI and the animatronics. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think they did quite struggle there. I mean, you know. The history of this film is that before they went all out with CGI and they decided that it was a viable option for this film, it was going to be made with stop motion animation by Phil Tippett, who obviously worked oh, on yeah. Star Wars, Robocop, a lot of big films, very big name in in stop motion animation. And on the making of, there is actually the, uh, the version that he made, basically, of with all the stop motion animation dinosaurs. Yeah. Which you know obviously doesn't hold up to to the CGI but they they used, basically used his stop motion animation clips to make the film. They are pretty much the exact same movements and everything else that that become the final film with the CGI. But that's definitely a a clear sort of it's a clear. You can clearly notice that there's a difference between the animatronics and the CGI with the Velociraptors. Yeah. 
Although I must admit, like you were talking about the the horror element with the um, Dilophosaurus, the scene in the kitchen with mm. the Velociraptors, I think, is very horror. There's something about like the shining or something about that scene, you know, where they're yeah. hiding, and um, and then when the Velociraptors start basically speaking to one, I mean, they're not speaking, but they're you know communicating somehow with each other. And they are very much in this, I don't know if we'll come on to talk about the later movies, but in this movie, they are very much the villain um, because they're so clever and yeah. because they're not necessarily just hunting because they want food. It's becoming like a sport to them. Whereas with the T-Rex, I think it's different. I think the T-Rex is just wanting fed. Yeah. Whereas the Velociraptors are almost like playing with them a little bit and just making it a bit more of a game because they are. it's insinuated that they are so clever. Funnily enough, I actually not that long ago was reading about Velociraptors and apparently they're tiny. They were mm-hmm. tiny. They were really quite small in comparison yeah. to how big they were in this um, in this movie. But um, I, I think the scene in the kitchen despite maybe the the CGI not being as good, I think the the actual tension, and that's, you know, from the bit where I think Timmy's sitting with his jelly and you see it behind the screen, Mm -hmm. from that bit to the end of the movie, I mean, you really are on kind of tender hooks. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, about, you know, and obviously the T-Rex saves the day because the T-Rex always saves the day because (laughs) the T-Rex becomes like the... The um the hero, uh, but but yeah, and also the other scene I was going to mention that I when I was talking about the daytime, the CGI maybe not being as strong, was the bit where there's like a stampede and they have to the hide. Galamimus. You know, Galamimus. Um, I mean, I think it is good because you've got them and then a, the T Rex suddenly rocks up and you know mm-hmm. starts eating them, so it's a really good scene. But I think just with it being daytime and stuff, I just think. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the CGI date. And I mean, CGI is going to date. It's like 30 years down the line. But I, I do think it is slightly, because that's obviously all CGI. I don't think there's much in the way of... Well, do you know what is that I think is actually the worst bit of effects work in this film? And it bugs me every time. And it's only because <laughs> it's only because I've watched the making of, right. of this film or read something about the behind the scenes. I forget where I saw it. The scene where uh, Lex, where they're crawling across the top of the vents when they're being chased by the Velociraptors, mm-hmm. and Lexi falls through. Yeah, yeah. And holds, she's holding on uh, with her legs dangling before she gets pulled up. And to do that, they had a stunt double who played Lexi. Mm-hmm. But the stunt double on the cut, the only cut that they could use, looks up straight at the camera because it's a, a top-down view of, of what she's doing. And she looks up at the camera and obviously it's a stunt double so you can see that it's not Ariana Richards. So they had to CGI implant Ariana Richards' face onto hers the moment that she looks up. And if you watch that f- scene, you can just see it. It's so discombobulating but it's one of those things if you didn't know about it you wouldn't yeah. fucking see it but because i know about it every time uh... i watch that scene i see it um and it's just so distracting but that's again just because i'm a big movie nerd and uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's the behind the scenes stuff but it is it is just incredible it still looks great you know it looks i mean the lost world i would say probably kept that um consistency with the cgi and stuff yeah Jurassic Park 3, fucking, you can tell everything that's, a, the, the difference between mm-hmm. everything that's CGI and everything that's an, animatronic in that film. It's incredibly, sh- you know, shonky compared to the first two films. And obviously the CGI developed a lot further once we get to the Jurassic World films, but pound for pound, I think this film holds up so well in terms it of does. effects. It, it just looks incredible and feels incredible. It does. Agreed. So let's get on to the music. So uh, I think every film that we're going to be discussing on this uh, on this mini series is um, by John Williams, and you know this is again another banger, another classic, and probably um, which I'm sure we'll we'll get into. But I'll let you go first. I think it's probably the best in terms of music. Well, when we recorded the episode about our favourite scores, this was one of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the music's incredible. I 
mentioned on that episode that I went to see the Scottish National Orchestra last year play the music while the movie played. It was an amazing experience, like one of those things where, I, you know, it's not a film that I cry at, but, you know, I, I was very emotional a couple of times. I think that the the music's just spectacular. I mean, I think John Williams and Steven Spielberg just work so well together, let's be honest. Mm. I mean, the music in all my favourite Spielberg movies is fantastic, but there's something about the score, you know, Welcome to Jurassic Park, the tense music, the just everything where, yeah, I mean... It's difficult for me to talk about without just saying I think it's incredible, but essentially that that's what I think. I think the whole score to this movie is incredible, and it's a yeah. score that I listen to fairly regularly. Yeah, I mean, you know, I would encourage anybody to head on over to our Patreon page and check out an episode on top five scores. Uh, but aside from that, I think this is, you know, I, as I talked about on that episode, you know, there's very, you know, with Jaws, you've got the... Dun -it, dun -it. And you've got very, very sort of uh, inflections of the the score across that film. The same with Indiana Jones. You know, yeah. you've got the main theme, the Indiana Jones theme, and you've got the inflections throughout that film. E.T. exactly the same. You know, uh, Close Encounters. You know, the, the Spielberg uses a lot of John Williams' film uh, scores. Yeah. To different effects in his films and stuff, but there's. It's very rare that you get outside of maybe the Star Wars canon or, you know, other sort of things like maybe Sergio Leone kind of films and Ario Modicone kind of scores. It's rare that you get two pieces within a score that just indelibly link you to a film. You know, if you said to somebody, what's, what's the music from Jurassic Park? They're either going to go... Dun, 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 yeah. Or they're gonna go. Dun, 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 dun. The whole of that score just works and is so memorable for two different pieces of the same run through the film. Really, you know, the, the, yeah. you've got this sort of heart and this sort of humanistic part of the film where. You know, you get the da -na -na, da -da -da -na -na. and then you know the the excitement is sort of ramped up by this other part of it, which is the da -da 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 -da. I'm butchering it all here, obviously. No, but, no, no, you're making a good job of it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. It, 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 it's not very often you get that. You get maybe that one point of a of a score. You get a very good score and a score that works for the rest of the film and ebbs and flows and all that sort of thing. But this, you know, has two main pieces within it that just work yeah. through the whole of the film. And it is, it, you know, it is probably the most accessible of John Williams scores. I mean, mm. sure, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of Jaws, obviously, because we've already discussed that on this series, but Jura the Jurassic Park score just completes everything yeah. much more. You know, where Jaws uses that score to represent the shark and all that sort of stuff, um, you know, we talked about in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the score or part of the score is there to represent a an arc within the storyline. Yeah. This is much more classic sort of film scoring and it takes it to just another level. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I think it's incredible. Like I said, it's one of my, it's my favourite Spielberg um, score and I like a lot of them. Mm. But um, yeah, I just think it's incredible. Um, So we sort of touched on one or two sort of hallmarks in terms of Spielberg while we've been discussing Jurassic Park. But... I suppose the only one that we haven't mentioned, or from from my perspective, is is that sort of family dynamic because Spielberg is quite well known for for sort of dropping in these these sort of troubled relationships and families and things like that, and you get yeah. sort of this. You don't necessarily get it so much in your face in this episode, but obviously Lexi and 
and and and Tim are sort of taken away from their mother and father, whatever their relationship is, and it's probably more explicitly sort of looked at in later films that weren't directed by Steven Spielberg. But yeah, you know, he's very much you know you've got the children in this film, you've got the, the child actors, you've got the um the suspense, you've got the horror, you've got the comedy. There's a lot of comedy in this film. There's a lot yeah. of funny scenes, a lot of funny characters. Um, you've got a lot of bureaucracy, I think, whether or you know, you know, suggestions of capitalism and and things like that. But I mean, outside of that, Vanessa, do you think there's anything else that's that's a real sort of staple of of, of Spielberg? I mean, there is like the moral of the story, mm-hmm. like you just shouldn't fuck with certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I suppose you could potentially draw a comparison between somebody like Hammond and like the Mayor and Jaws for instance, Mm -hmm. who is more interested in, you know, not necessarily money, but, you know, like spectacle or like wanting to to keep things going rather than actually thinking this is really dangerous and we need to stop it. Um, But yeah, aside from that, I don't know if there are any other Spielberg tropes as such, apart unless you can call a trope just being a fucking brilliant movie. (laughs) 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 <laughs> yeah that's true that's true but yeah i mean th- i think it's a very it's a very good choice i mean you know it, i think it's it's a difficult one i think it would be a very close second for me i think Jurassic park it's either that or raiders i think it's it's a very close call for me i mean it's it's certainly one of the first Spielberg films that I remember seeing. It, it was definitely the first Spielberg film I remember seeing after being conscious of who Steven Spielberg is. Yeah. You know, it's that one that was in my lifetime that I would have, it, that would have been accessible to me outside of Hawk. I maybe wasn't, you know, a cinema goer at that point. You know, it would have been whoever would have taken me to see it but i don't don't remember being excited about hook or um it being something on my radar at that point i'm a defender of hook i i know you are i know you are but (laughs) at the same time it wouldn't i wouldn't have i don't think i would have hounded my parents to go and see hook pretty sure at this point i would have hounded my parents to go and see jurassic park because it's fucking dinosaurs i know and it's it's just (laughs) Like I said, I mean, I, I watch it kind of fairly regularly. Um, I know it like the back of my hand. Like normally when we record an episode, I rewatch a movie if I've seen it before. And I didn't even feel the need to do that with this movie mm-hmm. because I know it so, so well. And I love Jaws. I love E.T. I love Ray. I love the whole um, original Indiana Jones trilogy. Mm-hmm. Um, Hook that you mentioned there, I personally think is really underrated. Chandler's List, <laughs> obviously a fantastic film. I mentioned Minority Report earlier, which I love. But yeah. to me, I mean, this is in my, this is the only Spielberg film in my kind of top 10 movies of all time. Well, that's it. I, uh, I mean, when, when you think about it, how incredible is this that he was making Jurassic Park and Schindler's List pretty much back to back. I know. I mean, how, I was actually... how the fuck does anybody do that? I actually was a wee bit disappointed in, um, I don't know if you saw that documentary about Spielberg that came out a couple of years ago. I can't remember mm. the name of it. It might have just been called Spielberg. And it was like two and a half hours long. And I really expected that it'd be like a big chunk on Jurassic Park, but they kind of chose to kind of sidestep that and focus more on Schindler's List which I understand and um, you know with Steven Spielberg's background and stuff Schindler's List was a really important film to him but they didn't go into um, Jurassic Park in the kind of depth that I'd hoped that um, they would and as as much as I think Schindler's List is a fantastic film it's not the kind of film that I would put on as like a comfort movie you know it's just not but it's Jurassic Park reminds me of my childhood reminds me of how awesome dinosaurs are um like you said it's funny it's got horror elements it's exciting it's just to me it is like a perfect Mm. movie it's not too long it's you know yeah 
and even any criticisms of it, they're not big enough that no. would that would make me think but it's it is, not a great film. You know, we t- we've talked about sort of Spielberg hallmarks, and this is very much has that. You know, this has the hallmarks that Jaws has, that Raiders has, um, and they're just the parts that I think everybody loves about Steven Spielberg, and this probably sort of ramps them up in certain aspects, certainly in terms of visuals for the time and we can't forget that this film was a trendsetter really you know in terms of cgi and what could be achieved from computer generated imagery it's just incredible in 1993 you think about films in the late 90s that were still not getting it right with cgi this film is just a incredible incredible in terms of its its effects yeah no it is it's incredible it stands up today and like it's the type of film that i even know like i I don't have kids but i've got friends and they're like Mm. you know when they show their kids jurassic park for the first time despite it being 30 years old or 31 years old now their kids Mm. are still like fascinated by it my my son is obsessed with dinosaurs and he's he's watched them all i mean he, he probably won't remember them as he sort of goes along he's only four but you know, he'll watch them and he's fascinated by them and he's got all the toys, the Jurassic World toys. And just before we wrap up, I was hoping I'd find more of these because there are knocking about down here somewhere because this whole floor down here is my kid's sort of play area. All right, okay. But I'm going to... This this might... You might think you sad bastard, but um, you might be really impressed with this. Okay. But I have... I've got somewhere else more of these knocking around, but I have an original 1993 Ellie Sattler. Wow. I've That's probably worth something. <laughs> I've got an Ellie, uh, an Alan Grant somewhere, and I've got a Tim somewhere. Wow. That is imp- no, but I'm impressed by that. Even more impressive than that. I have an original 1993 <gasps> T Rex. That is cool. She's awesome. I love her. <laughs> See that bit right at the end of the movie where the sign falls down and she roars and it says, you know, when dinosaurs rule the yeah. earth. It's just fantastic. The, the thing I remember when I was young that I had was a Jurassic Park backpack. So when I was a kid, <laughs> I had a backpack for school that had like the, the Jurassic Park logo on it. Mm-hmm. And I found it when I was like 18, going to Redden Music Festival for the first time and I took it to Redden and used it like a backpack and see the amount of people that stopped me. I mean that was a while ago now, but the amount of people that stopped me and was like, oh my God, you're not so yeah. <laughs> And even now, like if I wear, like I said, I've got like a couple of t-shirts and stuff. Like if I wear them out and about that like generally one person will say to you oh i love your t-shirt like, yeah. i love jurassic park because well, it it's such yeah. a well-known cultural in fact and I, I know we're kind of uh, rounding up but um years ago now in fact i think it was my brother-in-law's 21st and he's 30 this year we went to a comedy night at a local theater and we arrived late so we had to sit in the front row which is obviously the worst thing at a comedy night but thankfully there was a guy next to us who had a jurassic park tattoo <laughs> and the comedian that was on stage just started ripping the piss out of this tattoo and he's like well, i see that. what what does what does the writing say and this guy was like really sheepish and stuff and he's like mm, and he's like no see what's the writing and the guy was like it says life will find a way and i was like that's amazing that's a great tattoo <laughs> like, i wouldn't be embarrassed by that i would be like look at that tattoo no but um yeah love it and, and it's such a well-loved movie so mate like when you speak to people you know about jurassic park they do mm. yeah i've never talked to somebody that says i don't like jurassic park you know what you think we're in we, you, at the end of the day, we're in 2024. Two years ago, there was the sixth film released. Don't talk to me about that film, please. Which? The shit. <laughs> and I don't mind but, some of the sequels. I do not mind some of the yeah. sequels, but that is fucking, that was fucking It's trash, it is trash. But it's still going, you know, and we're, we're you know, a couple of years' time, we're getting another one. I think um, that's mm. been announced quite recently. What? It can't be any worse than the last right now, to be fair. Because <laughs> that one, I mean, we haven't really talked about uh, the sequels. Um, the original couple, you know, Lost World and Jurassic Park 3, I actually don't mind. Like, I, I think those two, the Lost World, I think, is better before it gets to 
Is it San Diego or whatever, and it becomes... The, like I think the, lo- the thing with The Lost World is it's aged well. I think yeah, at yeah. the time, it was very much sort of thought of as a big cash grab and yeah. everything else and didn't hold up to the original. It's a tough act to follow, but yeah, I think in terms of you know of nostalgia and and how it's it's maybe developed or how how it's aged is 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 really good i mean i Jurassic part 3 i thought was pretty av- very average i didn't mind it i thought it was quite a good kind of b movie um i mean it's only an hour and a half long i i actually thought like as a kind of classic b movie i didn't mind it jurassic world I thought was quite exciting seeing the mm-hmm. park like operational yeah. at the start. Yeah, yeah. It was quite cool. But then I thought the characters were soulless and as it went on, I liked it less. Funnily enough, I can't remember the name of it, the second Jurassic World. Fallen Kingdom. I actually thought that was pretty good. Yeah, I think it, it sort of set out to, 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 to make a point, which I think it kind of did. I think yep. the maybe sort of haunted mansion ending that, that it sort of ended up was... I didn't mind that. I thought yeah. that was quite... I mean, it's not great, but I thought it was quite good fun and at least tried to do something a bit different. But mm. that most recent one, I mean, I was quite excited about it because Sam Neill, Laura yeah. Dern and Jeff Goldblum and they are back. they fucked them over, didn't they, and, completely? Well, yeah, because I thought, oh, we're finally going to see the world with, like, man and dinosaur having to coexist. That's a really exciting concept. Like, how does that work? And instead, it was just all about fucking locusts. Yep. And I was like, well, I remember going to see that on my own. I got the whole cinema that it's now shut down, sadly, but the local cinema was showing it during the day. I found myself at a loose end and I was like, I'm just going to go and see this. Got the whole <laughs> cinema myself. I was like, great, popcorn, had a glass of wine, the whole cinema myself. And honestly, I was disgusted. I was. I walked out of that cinema being I, like... Do you know what? what? I watched it again, actually, the other week. I think it's recently dropped onto Netflix and it was like... Right, right. But you know, I mean, there's there's enough spectacle in it to to kind of rewatch it and just sort of take in the you know switch your brain off a a bit. But yeah, it did ruin it completely. It did, it, it, and all the stuff about the velociraptors and trying to domesticate them and stuff. I'm like, that just doesn't work. Like that's against the point of velociraptors. I'm also not a massive fan of is it Chris Pratt. You know, I like Chris Pratt. I, mm, I like him in the Guardians movies, but maybe, do you know what it is? It's probably clouded my judgment that I've heard of some stuff about him in real life. And you know how sometimes that can happen when you start mm, reading it? Okay. Yeah, there's, look at him, there's some dodgy stuff. Um, But I just, and I'm not a fan of, um, is it Dallas Bright? What's her name? Bryce Dallas Howard. Howard. Yes, uh, Ron Howard's daughter. I'm a massive fan of her. So I suppose maybe I just don't <laughs> connect with those characters Fair enough. As, as much. But I I think like going back to the original, it's a classic. Um, it'll always be a classic, and uh, it's been really fun talking about it actually because um, it's one of those movies I could just talk about for hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, that 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 about wraps us up, really, Vanessa. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you're here and you're part of the Movie Joe podcast, but where else can people find you and where? Um, else can can they listen to to some of your work? Well, outside movie Jewel, obviously you and I do the so called X Files podcast, which is we're currently um, coming to the end of season one. Um, so you can find that anywhere that you get your podcasts. We've got the so called X Files podcast Facebook group, and to contact me personally, you're probably better going on Instagram eh, at Vanessa Cordner or on Facebook at Vanessa L. Cordner. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining me on this uh, Jurassic Park re- retrospective. It's been great. And your choice for the best Steven Spielberg movie. Um, and it just leaves me to say goodbye. And for Vanessa to say... Clever girl. <laughs> <laughs>